One of the biggest questions that a God-fearing person faces is, how can I recognize when God is sending me a sign? You have probably felt that he is sending you a sign, but are not sure. Today you will learn to recognize when God is sending you a sign. May God bless your spiritual journey with this guide today. In a world where many people say, I believe in a God, but not in a personal God, the search for divine signs can seem confusing and uncertain. These people feel that the mysterious force behind everything must be more than a person. But what does Lewis mean by this? Why should we believe in a personal God? Well, if we understand God as an impersonal force rather than a personal being with whom we can interact and have an intimate relationship, we will never be able to recognize the signs he sends us. Lewis reminds us that the purpose for which we exist is to be so taken into the life of God. Wrong ideas about what this life is will make it more difficult. Therefore, to truly understand when God is sending a sign, it is crucial to recognize that when it comes to knowing God, the initiative lies on his side. If he does not show himself, nothing you can do will enable you to find him. This leads us to a fundamental conclusion. The only adequate instrument for learning about God is the whole Christian community waiting for him together. Thus, we can understand that our purpose is to enter into the life of God and be in a personal and vital relationship with him. As it says in Jeremiah 10.10, 10, But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. At his wrath the earth trembles and the nations cannot endure his indignation. In this way, it will be much easier to identify God's signs. For this, it is essential to approach with a humble heart, recognizing his sovereignty and seeking guidance not only individually but in communion with other believers. The clarity and confirmation of divine signs are above all the fruit of a sincere and collective relationship with God, where he and only he reveals himself to us unmistakably. Now how can we feel when God is sending us a sign? What changes when something happens by chance compared to when God is trying to communicate something profound to us? Firstly, there are signs and wonders. These are used by God according to his will, but we should never demand this kind of sign, for it is not our place to test God. As Jesus taught us in Luke 4.12, Jesus answered, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Lewis tells us that miracles are a reminder that nature, in the end, is incomplete, and there is something beyond it, something that nature itself cannot explain. However, it is important to remember that we should not test God by demanding specific signs. True faith is trusting in God regardless of whether we see visible signs or not. The second type of sign refers to the indications of the biblical principles that God wants us to follow. Lewis tells us that the way to divine guidance is through a life dedicated to prayer and the study of scriptures. The answers we seek are often already answered in the words of the Bible and it is through reflection and prayer that we can discern God's will for our lives. These are the signs that Christians should always seek to understand how to live according to divine will. Imagine you are seeking God's guidance about whether you should date someone. Instead of looking for a falling star, first ensure that this person shares the same faith. If they are not Christian, that is a clear sign that God does not want that relationship for you. As taught in 2 Corinthians 6.14 Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. Thirdly, there are signs that fall into horoscopes and superstitions. Lewis tells us that prayer, not superstition, is the way to discern God's will. 
we should seek divine guidance in scriptures and in our communion with him, not in empty signs and superstitions. True guidance comes from an intimate relationship with God, where he reveals his will through his word. These signs arise when we seek symbolic meanings in things irrelevant to our questions addressed to God. For example, a falling star should not be interpreted as a divine indication to start a relationship, as this does not align with biblical truth and relationship principles. Christians should avoid involving themselves with such signs. In this video we discuss the second category of God's signs. Below are five common indications that God may truly be sending you a sign. First clue. If what you believe you have heard from God comes true in reality, it is likely a divine sign. Lewis tells us, what is the use of reason? Reason can help us understand the evidence that God is guiding us, but true confidence comes from recognizing that there is a will higher than ours. Often what we think is divine guidance may be influenced by our desires and thoughts. However, when we see God's actions manifest in the world, we have a tangible confirmation of his will. It is this confidence in God, regardless of our internal doubts, that allows us to follow his path. A common mistake is to value more what we hear internally than what we observe externally. God gives you some control over your thoughts and feelings but most external events are under his control. Thus, if something happens outside your control, it is more likely to be God's work when you feel you have heard something in your heart. How do you discern if it is your imagination or a divine message? Confirmation comes when what you heard manifests in the real world. You can imagine God's voice internally but only God can create tangible evidence externally. Therefore, it is not enough to feel that God has told you something. If it is truly a divine message, it will come to pass. Titus 1 2 states that God never lies and his words always come true. If something you feel you heard from God does not happen, the problem does not lie in God's power, but in our ability to hear and interpret his message. Deuteronomy 18.21 22 clarifies, You may say to yourselves, How can we know when a message has not been spoken by the Lord? If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously. So do not be alarmed. Second clue, when a significant event related to what you asked God happens, it is likely a divine sign. Lewis tells us, God, who made times and places, who is the author of all nature, can and does intervene in his own works. The true understanding of God's sovereignty is to recognize that he has absolute control over everything that happens. He is not subject to the laws he created, but governs them and, when necessary, transcends them. This means that significant events in our lives, especially those that respond to our prayers and needs, are manifestations of his sovereign will. A crucial principle for correctly interpreting the Lord's signs is to recognize his sovereignty. God's sovereignty means that he has absolute control over everything that happens. God is not a powerless being constantly reacting to humans. This would make humans the primary cause of all events, which contradicts several biblical passages that affirm God's sovereign plan. Understanding God's sovereignty is essential for discerning his will, for God communicates through the circumstances of our lives, being the one who controls these events. I am sure that all of you, like me, have experienced having a loved one diagnosed with a serious illness. It is right to pray for complete healing here on earth, for God encourages us to pray in this way. However, God's will for that situation will be revealed by the unfolding events. If the sick person recovers, 
it is a sign that God's will was their recovery. If the person passes away, it is an indication that God had a different plan for that circumstance. To illustrate with a less serious situation, consider someone starting a relationship shortly after you ask God if you should date that person, or if you ask God about making an offer on a house and suddenly the house is taken off the market. Clearly that is a sign that God's answer is no. If you are seeking guidance about starting to sing publicly and unexpectedly, the worship leader at your church invites you to join the worship team. That can be seen as a clear sign from God. Let's look at what happened in John 13. Jesus predicted to his twelve disciples that one of them would betray him. He gave a sign to John by dipping the bread in the wine and handing it to Judas, as described in John 13, 25, 26. However, for the other disciples, God's answer about who the betrayer was came a few chapters later in John 18, 3. So Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns and weapons. God clarified their doubts through the circumstances he allowed to happen with Judas. Random and disconnected events should not be interpreted as divine signs, but when something significant happens directly related to something you have prayed about, it is usually a sign from the Lord. Third clue. If the Bible directs you to act in a certain way to fulfill the scriptures in a specific situation, it is a sign from God. Lewis tells us that true Christian faith is not just about believing the right things, but about living in a way that reflects those teachings. The Bible is not a rigid instruction manual. It is a source of wisdom that guides us in all areas of life. We must learn to apply biblical principles with discernment and sensitivity to the specific circumstances we face. God calls us to be not just rule followers, but wise people who understand and live according to his will. Biblical knowledge is understanding what the Bible teaches. Biblical wisdom is knowing how to apply that knowledge to your life. God calls us to be not just knowledgeable, but also wise. The Bible does not just provide commands and truths that we follow automatically. Rather, God teaches us to live wisely throughout the scriptures. An excellent example of this is in 1 Corinthians 8. In this passage, Paul instructs the Corinthians about when they should eat certain foods and when they should not. He does not provide a grocery list of the only foods a Christian should eat, nor does he say that in all situations a Christian can eat whatever they want. In summary, in 1 Corinthians 8, Paul explains that Christians have the freedom to eat any food, even if it was offered to an idol, because they know idols are not real. There is only one God, so food offered to idols is just food. However, Paul qualifies this freedom with what he said in 1 Corinthians 8, 7, 13. However, not everyone possesses this knowledge. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat sacrificial food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a god, and since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat, and no better if we do. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone with a weak conscience sees you, with all your knowledge eating in an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother or sister, for whom Christ died, is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against them in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ 
Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause them to fall. Paul emphasizes that although we may have freedom, we must consider others' consciences. If what we eat causes a brother to stumble in their faith, it is better to abstain, so as not to harm them spiritually. Fourth clue. The Bible teaches us about certain causes and effects, so the causes you observe around you indicate that the effects are near. Lewis tells us that every action we take is a step towards heaven or hell. Our choices shape our character and consequently our destiny. The Bible is clear in teaching that certain actions have inevitable consequences. Biblical wisdom reveals to us that behaviors like laziness and foolishness bring negative results, while diligent work and wisdom lead to rewards and growth. Throughout the scriptures, God reveals the outcomes of certain behaviors. In Proverbs, for example, we learn that hard work brings rewards, while laziness leads to poverty. We are also told that if you rebuke a fool, he will hate you, but if you rebuke a wise man, he will love you for it. The point is that the Bible explains various causes and their effects. This means that when God shows you a cause, it is a sign that the corresponding effect is coming. If someone is being lazy, it indicates that poverty is near. If someone has rebuked a fool, it signals that the fool's negative reaction is about to happen. In Matthew 24, Jesus gave several warnings about what will happen before his second coming. In Matthew 24, 28, he said, Wherever there is a carcass, there the vultures will gather. Although this statement may sound strange to our modern ears, in context, I believe Jesus is illustrating the principle of cause and effect. A carcass attracts vultures. Similarly, when we see the signs mentioned in Matthew 24, it is an indication that his second coming is near. This principle applies to all of life. When the Bible describes a cause and effect and you witness the cause, it is a sign that the effect is about to occur as well. Fifth clue. When God is giving you a sign, you will gain clarity and not confusion. Lewis tells us that prayer is how we connect with God, and through it, he gives us the clarity we seek. When we ask for guidance, he does not leave us in darkness, but illuminates us with his wisdom. God is not an author of confusion. He guides us in ways that we can understand his will, provided we approach him with a sincere and open heart. A common mistake is to incessantly seek the meaning of a specific event, trying to discover what God is saying. While it is wise to ask this question, it is not prudent to insist if the answer does not come. Forcing a meaning for every little thing that happens in life is not wise. God is capable of making you understand what he wants to communicate. If something strange occurs and you do not know what it means, it is more likely that it is not a sign from God, for he is not the author of confusion, as it is written in 1 Corinthians 14.33. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. And as Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, 7, Reflect on what I am saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all this. God is the one who grants understanding. When you need wisdom, you should ask for it, as James 1.5 says. However, sometimes confusion persists because it is not a sign from God, and he has nothing to communicate about it. The point is that if God is sending you a sign, you will understand what it means. For God can make you comprehend if you ask him for wisdom being intentionally ignorant or rebellious about what you know God is saying is one thing, but if you sincerely seek to follow God's will and approach him humbly, he will not send signs to increase your confusion. You can trust in the Lord. 
He knows exactly how to direct you to the path he wants you to follow. We never like to end a video without a prayer. Despite the message being blessed, we like you to have a small but blessed conversation with God. Now we invite you to join us in prayer. O oh God of infinite love and wisdom, in your presence we seek today to discern the signs you send in our lives. We know that each significant event has the potential to reflect your will for us. Grant us, Lord, the ability to clearly recognize these signs, so we are not misled by false interpretations or fleeting illusions. Give us deep spiritual discernment so we can understand the true nature of your signs. May our hearts be open to receiving your guidance with humility and gratitude, and may our minds be illuminated by your divine light, guiding us every step of the way. Lord, we know that not all circumstances are direct signs of your will, and that is why we cry out for your wise guidance. May our faith be strengthened to discern what is from you and what is not. Empower us to face changes and challenges with courage, trusting that you are with us in all circumstances. Additionally, we ask for your powerful healing for all wounds that prevent us from fully responding to your calls. If there are any emotional, spiritual or physical barriers that keep us from you, May your restorative grace reach us deeply. May we be purified and renewed by your infinite mercy, enabled to live according to your perfect will. May our spiritual journey be marked by your constant presence and unwavering love. Grant us the grace to persevere, even when the paths we tread seem difficult or uncertain. May our trust be firmly anchored in you, O God knowing that in you that we find our peace and security. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour and Redeemer, may all these words be true in our lives. Amen. I want to thank everyone for watching until the end. It is always an honour to be part of your mornings, afternoons and nights of inspiration and search for the Lord's Word. May God bless each one of you and your families. Until the next video.